All right. Now, now you say you've seen us online, but you don't really understand what's going on. Uh, Tell me what you've heard, you know, so I can. You know, the basic things like like you don't have to follow. It. Basically, you don't have to follow the laws on those. When you're saying, and you're saying you can't eat pork and all that. Correct. Right? Correct, because that's what the Bible says. Now, Christianity. I know Jesus was, says something about pork. What he said. You have to find it he for said me. Something we, about we've been we've been looking. Uh, I've been looking for it for about ten years, and I ain't been able to find it. So I'd be happy to give you maybe five or ten minutes, see if you can. <laughs> but I'm gonna tell you what Christ did say. Give me Matthew chapter five, verse seventeen. This is what Christ said out of His own mouth, and I'm gonna show you how Christianity tries to twist it up to say something completely different. Check this out. The book of Matthew chapter five, verse seventeen. Uh -huh. Think not. Christ said, "Think not. Don't even let the thought." Go into your mind that I am come to destroy the law. Don't let the thought come into your mind that I'm coming to destroy the law. That's what Christ said. Red letters. Show it to him. These are red letters. These are red letters. What did the law say about pork? Say that's a no. Yeah, Leviticus 11 and 7. Real quick, Christ said, think not. Don't allow that thought to come into your mind that I've come to destroy the law. I'm going to show you what the law said. The book of Leviticus chapter 11 verse 7. Uh -huh. And the swine, though he divide the hoof, so pork, and be cloven footed, uh -huh. yet he to have not the cut. Uh -huh. He is unclean to you. The Bible says, the law said, the swine is unclean to you. And what did Christ say about the law? He didn't come to destroy it. He didn't come to destroy it. So I'm so, not, so not going to eat pork. All praises. All praises right there. All praises to the most high. But let's carry on because Christians don't even want to try to explain that part. They want to try to use the other part to try to justify satisfying their own lust. They like pork. So they're going to use a different part of the verse to try to say, this is what Christ meant. But I'm going to show you that part too. Read verse uh, 17 again. Yes, sir. Matthew chapter 5 verse 17. Uh -huh. Think not that I am come to destroy the law uh -huh. or the prophets. Or the prophets. Or the prophets. I'm going to show you something that the prophets said. Give me Ezekiel 39 and 23. I think that's what I want. Ezekiel 29, 39 and 23. Read that. Tell me what that said. Ezekiel chapter 39 verse 23 uh -huh. and the heathen shall know so the heathen know so the nations outside of these people right here they know that the house of Israel that the Israelites which you and I are went into captivity for their iniquity so all the other races know the reason that we get punished the way that we are today the reason we came over here on slave ships the reason Derek Chauvin put his knee, the knee on the neck of George Floyd is because we've broken God's commandments. So if the heathen were teaching us, what would they teach us to do? Would the heathen teach us to keep God's commandments or would they teach us to continue breaking God's commandments? They would teach us to continue breaking God's commandments. So what did Christ just say about the prophets? Read that again. Matthew chapter 5 verse 17. Uh -huh. Think not. Don't let the thought come into your mind. That I am come to destroy the law. That I'm come to destroy the law. Which told you don't eat pork. Read on. Or the prophets. Don't let the thought come into your mind. That I came to destroy what the prophets said either. And what did the prophets say? The prophets said that the heathens, your enemies, are the ones that will want you to break the law. Your enemies are the ones that want you to break the commandments. But there's other parts of the law, like the dress code, that, you know, it's, a lot of people don't understand. So They don't understand it, but we'll explain it for you today. All right, now read on. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And that's the part that Christianity want to take and try to use it to justify that fulfill means to do away with. Now, wouldn't that be a lot? That's that's a lot of confusion. I if, struggle with, with if fulfill, Christ said, what does that mean? You don't got to struggle no more. The prophets are here to explain it to you. That's what we're here to explain it to you because Christianity want to create so much confusion. They want to tell you that the beginning of the verse, Christ said, I'm not going to do away with it. But the end of the verse, he like changed his mind mid speech. You're my brother, but I, you're not really my brother. Do you think the son of God would speak like that? 
So let me show you line upon line, precept upon precept, what Christ meant when he said, I don't come to destroy, I came to fulfill. The answer is in the book of Acts chapter 3 verse 18. So that's what you want to make note of. What does it mean for Christ to have fulfilled the law? Acts chapter 3 verse 18. The book of Acts chapter 3 verse 18. Uh -huh. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets. So the things that God showed by the mouth of all his prophets. Read. That Christ should suffer. The things that the prophet said that Christ should suffer, read, he hath so fulfilled. Those are the things that Christ fulfilled. There was prophecies that Christ had to come, die for the nation of Israel in order to gather the nation of Israel back together again. That's what he came to fulfill. So I'll give you an example. Go to Ezekiel chapter 37. Show him how the two the divide in the nations will be brought back together as one nation. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the history, but when you look at this chart right here, the nation of Israel is actually broken down into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. So here on the chart, the first three, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, represent the southern kingdom. From Ephraim on down to Naphtali, represent the northern kingdom. Now, at one point in time, there was just one kingdom. It was just the nation of Israel. But then there was a split. And in the midst of that split, the northern kingdom of Israel were no longer regarded as Israelites. Because they followed the ways of the heathen and of the oppressors and of the Gentiles. They became known as Gentiles. And that's what we read about in the New Testament. The prophecy was that somebody would come, be a sacrifice for them, to allow them to come back together and we all be one nation again. And that's what we're reading about in the New Testament. Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of the Messiah. Exactly. That's exactly. I'm going to show you one of the prophecies. You got what I want? Yes, sir. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 37 and verse 19. Uh -huh. Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim. That's the northern kingdom. And the tribes of Israel, his fellows. Which is, I'm sorry, read on. And will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah. Judah is the head of the southern kingdom, read. And make them one stick, and they shall be one in thine hand. So that's the prophecy that showed that Christ had to come to bring all the both sides of the kingdom back together. Read right. what you got. Verse 21. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen. So the children of Israel, also known as the Gentiles in the, in the New Testament, he will bring them from among the heathen. Read. Whether they be gone and will gather them on every side uh -huh. and bring them into their own land. Read. And I will make them one nation. You see that? I will make them one nation. That's what the prophet said a Messiah had to come to do. So when he said, think not that I come to destroy. I don't come to destroy. I come to fulfill exactly what you read about in Ezekiel 37. I'm here to bring the nation back together as one. All right. And I'm going to show you further proof that the commandments weren't done away with. Go back to Acts chapter 2. So in Acts chapter 2, the Israelites were celebrating a particular feast after Christ died and had ascended. He ascended in chapter 1. So if Christians are correct and Christ came to do away with the commandments, why were the Israelites still keeping the commandments in Acts chapter 2? Bring it out. I guess they still had to. Exactly. That's, right. That's exactly right. The real Christians, the real followers of Christ, always continue keeping the commandments. And I'm going to show you that next. Start at verse 1. The book of Acts chapter 2 verse 1. Now can we all agree that in Acts chapter 2 verse 1 these people were following Christ? In Acts chapter 2 they were following Christ, right? Let's see what these people who follow Christ did. Read. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Now who out here knows about the day of Pentecost? Anybody ever heard of Pentecost? Okay. Now who's heard of a Pentecostal Christian? Y'all heard about that? Now you can't find a Pentecostal Christian in the Bible. 
but you can find the day of Pentecost in the Bible. All right, let's show them the day of Pentecost in the Bible. Give me Leviticus chapter 23. I think that uses the word that I'm looking for. The day of Pentecost. Leviticus chapter 23 should be shortly after the Passover. Does it call it Pentecost in Leviticus 23? All right, well, give, give me Deuteronomy 16 and 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. I want to show you the significance of the day of Pentecost. Right, right. So it explains it, but it doesn't use that word. I want to make sure that we use the word. Because penta means 50, cost means day. So in Leviticus 23, it tells you to count seven Sabbaths, which will be 49. And then it says, on the morrow makes it 50. So the feast, the feast of Pentecost is also called Feast of Weeks. The number of weeks is explained in Leviticus 23 as seven weeks, seven Sabbaths, and then the, the morrow makes it the 50. The Deuteronomy 16 and 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. Uh -huh. Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the, before the Lord thy God. So the Lord said three times a year all the males must appear before the Lord God. So that means they must come back to Jerusalem. So when it says all thy males, just to explain it real quick, hold that Deuteronomy 1 and 1. Who is the thy? Because Christianity will try to take thy and all and try to always apply it to everybody. But the Bible makes it real plain. Deuteronomy 1 and 1. Who's the thy? The book of Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 1. Uh -huh. These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel. So the book of Deuteronomy are the words that Moses spake to who? My brother. All who? Read it again. He had tapped out. These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel. So these were the words that Moses spake unto all who? Moses spake unto who? All who? All Israel. All Israel. So in Deuteronomy 16 and 16, read it again. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 16, and verse 16. Uh -huh. Three times in a year shall all thy males. So all thy males. Same book, Deuteronomy, verse one, chapter one, verse one said all the Israelites. So we still talking about Israelites, right? That's the Bible. This, this is the holy Bible. The whole holy Bible. <laughs> no, that's a KJV for King James Version. This is the only version of the Bible that hasn't been altered, adulterated, perverted, and tampered with. It's the exact same as it was back in 1611 when it was translated. The King James Bible it came with 80 books. You had the Old Testament, you had the New Testament, and the Apocrypha. All right, the slave master who put us on chains and chains on ships took out the Apocrypha to make things a lot more confusing. And he didn't want you to read about the Maccabees, which were your own people that rose up against their oppressors, because he didn't want you to rise up against him as his oppressor. But what we've done, we've tapped back into the books that our forefathers have wrote so that we can give them back to the people, all right? Now the books written by our forefathers teach us that we must keep God's commandments. And that's what we're explaining today. Because the Christian church tells us that you can't keep the laws, the laws are done away with, Christ fulfilled the law, so that means you ain't gotta do it, you can do whatever you want. But the Bible don't say that. The Bible does not say what Christianity says. So we come out here to teach what the Bible says. So if you got a question, I'll give you an answer out of the Bible. All right, read that. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. Uh -huh. Three times in a year. Three times a year. Shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God. So all the Israelites, Israelites had to go back to Jerusalem at least three times a year. If you live somewhere else, you had to come back home at least three times a year. Read. Before the Lord thy God uh -huh. in the place which he shall choose. Jerusalem is the place where he chose. Read. In the feast of unleavened bread. The feast of unleavened bread is also called the Passover. That celebrates when we came out of Egypt. God delivered us out of Egypt by the hand of Moses, parted the Red Sea, turned the water into blood, killed all those Egyptians. Read on. And in the feast of weeks. And in the feast of weeks. Remember in Leviticus 23, after the Passover, you count seven Sabbaths, which is seven weeks, and then you add one. So 49 plus one makes 50. That's where Pentecost comes from. That's a Greek word, penta, like a pentagram got five sides. Pentecost means 50th day. So the Feast of Weeks is the, the Pentecost, read. Right? 
Amen. In the Feast of Tabernacles. And in the Feast of Tabernacles, which is another feast of the Israelites where they had to go back home. So now let's go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 1. The book of Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Uh -huh. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. The day of Pentecost was given to who, my brothers and sisters? It was given to the Israelites. It was never given to anybody else. So who are we reading about in Acts chapter 2? Israelites. So these people that were called Christians were actually what? Israelites. They were just following Christ. That's what the Bible is proving. Read on. They were all with one accord. The they that were all in one accord are the Israelites. Why are they on one accord? Because Deuteronomy chapter 16 verse 16 said three times a year, all the Israelites got to go back home. Read on. In one place. So the question that we pose is if Christ did away with the law, why is it that after he died and ascended, his followers were still keeping the law in Acts chapter 2? And the answer to that question is because the Christian church is full of a bunch of liars. That's right. <laughs> That's the answer to the question. Now, I'm gonna give me uh, give me First Peter two and twenty one, just to further establish the point that Christian church don't teach what the Bible says. All right. Now, I'm gonna ask y'all a question. What is sin? Something you ain't supposed to do. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. So we shouldn't be sinning, right? Should we be sinning? Our skin sins. Our flesh. The flesh, yeah, the flesh loves sin, right? The flesh enjoys sin. It feels good, it tastes good, all of that. Should we be sinning, my brother? We shouldn't be. Should we sin? Of course not. Okay, now who lived a life without sin? Jesus. Jesus Christ lived a life without sin. So the word Christian, so Christ means anointed one, right? Christian, you add I-A-N, that just means follower of. So if I'm a Christian, I'm followers of the anointed one, right? I'm followers of Christ. So if I'm supposed to be a follower of Christ, should I do what he did or should I do something different? Do what he did. What he did. I should do what he did. So a real Christian is going to do what Christ did. But Christ didn't do no sin. Right? Okay. Let's see if the Bible says that same thing. Read what you got. The book of 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 21. I heard you laugh, but it's very important because we want to make sure what we believe and what we teach actually comes out of the Bible. Because what, cause what if the Bible said Christians can start sinning? Then at that point, we would be justified in doing what? In sinning. But we're going to see what the Bible says about the Christians. Read what you got. For even everyone too were ye called. So all of you all were called. I ain't catch your name. What was your name, my brother? Akeem. Akeem. Claude. Claude. Chris. Chris. Rebecca. That's one of our four mothers right there. Yeah. Akeem, Claude, Chris, and Rebecca. You were all called. All of you all were called according to this scripture. Read on. Because Christ also suffered for us. Christ suffered for us. Christ suffered for a king, for Claude, for Chris, and for Rebecca. Christ suffered for you. Christ suffered for you, my sister. Read on. Leaving us an example. Christ left us an example. And did Christ sin? He didn't sin, read. That ye should follow his steps. So the Bible says that we should follow in the steps after Christ. So whatever he did is what we should do, right? Read on. Who did no sin. The Bible said Christ didn't do any sin. And as followers, we're supposed to follow his example. That's right. So for me to be a real Christian, isn't it important for me to know what sin is so that I can make sure that I don't do it? Since the person that I claim to follow didn't do it, that makes sense, right? That's like one plus one equals two, right? So now let's make sure we got a proper understanding of what sin is so that we can decide do we fully want to commit to being a Christian or not, all right? Because I like what you said. Sin is something we shouldn't do. Sin is something that we shouldn't do, and we all agreed on that. So now it's something that we shouldn't do, but let's be more specific on what are the things that I should not do. Like, is it a sin for me to... I know what you're Pick you know, up that leaf it, off the ground? It's in the transgression of the law. Oh, now you're hitting on something. Now you're hitting on something. You said you've been watching, and it's starting to come out now. All praises to the Most High. Now let's let the Bible speak, because we want to make sure that God is true through his word, and every man a liar, right? We want to make sure if what I'm saying, it, it got to be matching up with what the word of God says. So first job, 
the book of First John, chapter three, verse four. Y'all mind sliding over a little bit? I keep playing peekaboo, y'all. You know what I mean? I want to get a clear line of sight. All right, read it again. First John, chapter three, verse four. Uh huh. Whosoever committeth sin, whosoever committeth sin, transgresseth also the law. Whosoever commits sin. Transgresseth also the law. Read. For sin, for sin is the is the transgression. The transgression. The word transgress means to go against. So now the Bible is actually going to define what sin is. For sin is what? The transgression of the law. The the Bible says sin is the breaking of God's laws. So for me to be a real Christian and to follow after His example because He did no sin. I gotta understand what? The laws, the laws of God, right? Because I because whatever the laws of God say, for me to be a real Christian, I can't go against those. I cannot go against those. And that's what we come out here to teach our people. Give me Isaiah 58 and 1. So that you can understand what our true mission is. Because the things that we're doing right aren't getting us in trouble. The things that we're doing right are not plaguing our community. The things that we're doing right are not breaking up our marriages and causing our children to kill each other. It's the things that we're doing wrong. And those are the things that we must fix. Now this is our job as the prophets, the real prophets, the real teachers of the Bible. This is what we must do, read. The book of Isaiah, chapter 58, verse one. Uh -huh. Cry aloud. Our job is to cry aloud. So we bring a speaker out here to make sure that whatever we dialoguing with here, maybe they can hear it over there in that car too. Maybe they can hear it back there at that store too. Because all of us as a nation of people can benefit from what the word of God has to say. Read on. Spare not. And our job is not to spare your feelings. When you tell people what they're doing wrong, do they normally feel good about it or bad about it? They're going to feel bad about it. Now, if I spare your feelings, if I allow your emotions to affect me telling you what you're doing wrong, I'm not going to keep telling you what you're doing wrong. I'm going to be like, dang, she crying, or dang, he mad at me, so let me just let him do whatever he's doing so that we can still be cool. How you doing, my sister? But the Bible says that I can't spare your feelings. What do I have to do? Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Speak loud. And show my people their transgression. It's my job to show my people their transgressions. Read. And the house of Jacob, their sin. It's my job to show you your sins. What is the nation? Nation is men leading by example. Nation is family. is community. Nation is children with role models. Nation is unity. Nation is you. And finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. His word. His word. Hey,